Would you join me in welcoming our moderator, Charles, and then our two panelists, Josh and Jack. Thank you. Well, I'm up here because I get to, uh, I have the opportunity in my role uh, as one of the founders of FMA to uh, talk to a lot of you uh, throughout the year and talk to entrepreneurs um, that are starting in the space and talk to doctors like Josh and uh, people like Jack that are working in this area. So my role this whole conference is kind of as a, a, a communications uh, mover, uh, make sure that the conversation is uh, kind of flowing in what I hear as um, part. So I'm just going to sit here and be quiet most of the time because these are two of uh, my favorite people in the field, but uh, I might uh, come up with some questions and then help facilitate uh, some of the questions afterwards. Guys? You want to go ahead and... Yeah? All right. Uh, hi, I'm Jack Brown. I have a 66-page uh, presentation that I'm going to cut down to about 15. <laughs> so I thought everybody would appreciate that. Um, I'm honored to be here. I'm actually representing uh, small clinics, small businesses, uh, you know, the frontline physicians who are out there serving uh, patients every day. And uh, we started, as you know, Oregon Coast Dermatology four years ago. Uh, and uh, our goal was to eliminate all third-party payers to eliminate all the hassle, everything that, that is getting between the patient and the physician. Uh, it's my wife's philosophy that she works for the patient. She does not work for the insurance company. She does not work for the government. And, you know, it was, it was scary. Um, but the patients got it right away. It, it, it was very, very amazing. So a little bit about my background. I'm going to skip through a couple of these. Uh, I have a lot of extensive oil company background, and um, one of the companies I work for, uh, my company does pricing analysis. We get pricing from a rack, wholesale, uh, all the way down to a retail level every day. We bring all this data in from North America. We, uh, we manipulate it, we massage it, we model it, and then they, the, the traders and the, uh, and the people who do uh, oil company wholesale marketing then use these tools to, to price. And one of the things I, th I thought was interesting is um, gasoline is one of those products that is about as transparent as you can possibly get. You can't think of another product that you drive down the street and they're required to put their price right there in front of you all the time. And what that's done is it, it's changed you know, how you buy fuel. You don't really necessarily buy it just by you know, one or two cents you're starting to look for what's value added. So it, it, it's commoditized it. And I think that Dr. Smith, having your prices up there and now having other hospitals and other entities follow is, is creating a, a, a reference point for patients to be able to figure out what is a good cost for X, Y, Z procedure, which is something that they don't have right now available to them. So I'm gonna skip on. Whoops, I go back. Uh, I like Dilbert, and so I just thought I'd throw this up there. It reminded me a little bit of uh, the, uh, the, the troll pricing that's going on right now um, in the marketplace. And um, they, calls it, uh, they call it uh, Confusopoly, uh, which is basically, if we don't show our prices and we don't do anything, we can charge anything that we want to, and we can confuse the marketplace. And so patients really have trouble figuring out what something does cost them, and uh, they don't have a reference point for which to be able to figure it out. One of the things that we wanted to talk about today, and it may be obvious to some of you, is why are uh, direct pay prices so low in comparison to what other people charge? And it may seem obvious to you, but from a business perspective, when I first started looking at this, I was, I was shocked at what physicians have to go through uh, just, to, just to make a living. Uh, so I started going down and looking at all the different uh, the things that are, that are costing physicians time, costing them money, and taking away care from patients. Uh, mock, if you participate in mock, that's $3,300 a year. ICD-10, how many people are dreading uh, October? Um, you know, the cost of implementation, $56,000 to $226,000 just to implement, and we don't even know what the cost for denials are going to be yet. Collecting co-pays, uh, it can take up to 90 days, you know, to get your money back. Well, with a direct pay practice that, that we have, there, we, there are no receivables. 
patient has a problem, they come in, problem gets fixed, they pay for it, we're done. At the end of the day, we, we know exactly what we brought in, we know exactly what our run rate expenses are, and we know what our profit was. It, it's, it's an incredibly liberating experience to, to practice that way. Uh, HIPAA, you know, you've always got HIPAA hanging over us. We're, we're not a HIPAA entity because we don't transfer data electronically. Um, meaningful use, we all know with that 1% decrease up to 5%. Uh, administrative burdens, this is interesting. In nine, 2013, 58% uh, of physicians said they spent uh, one day a week just processing, doing administrative work. Uh, in 2014, uh, according to the Pro Practice Profitability Index, that number has risen to 70%. 70% of physicians are spending about a day of their time a week not practicing medicine, but doing administrative costs. And then just the fact that uh, just getting paid is, is, is a total hassle. Um, uh, rising operation costs, uh, this is also something, you know, it's um, uh, malpractice, liability insurance, uh, ICD-10, all of this, that it says that the, uh, in the past 11 years, the cost of running a practice has been twice the consumer price index. And so, you know, how do you continue to stay profitable when your prices are going up so bad in, in, in marketing a practice? You've got to figure out how to ratchet down your expenses. Uh, pay for performance, we know what's going on with that. IT, uh, they say an average IT staffer right now, and you must have an IT staff, is about $52,000 a year. And then that's not to mention how much IT is costing your practice. It's between $48,000 and $58,000 just to maintain the computer systems in addition to that IT person. And that's to take care of all the meaningful use, pay for performance, value-based pay modifiers, all these systems that really are not adding any value to the, your, your relationship with the patient. And you, you'll hear from Josh, he, he's got a system out there uh, that is absolutely brilliant uh, for uh, primary care. And I hope you can talk about that a little bit. Then there's commercial payer audits. We can go back, there's Stark audits, there's sham peer reviews, RAC, um, medical school debt, CPT coding, all of these things are contributing to just a massive amount of administrative costs that then somehow you're going to end up having to pass to the patient. And I was just thinking of something that happened to us last year, uh, Keith. Uh, we, uh, were, um, uh, we had a bill in front of the, uh, the house in Oregon, and the bill was basically that if we provide service to a patient, that the insurance companies would, would reimburse it based upon their, um, uh, based upon their uh, contract with the patient. And they were refusing to do that. Uh, they wanted us to fill out their forms with all their CPT codes and basically do all their administrative work for them. So when we sat down in front of, there were four insurance companies and all their lawyers, and then there's my wife, and uh, she's sitting there, and, and they said, well, um, you know, how's this going to save money? So we threw a couple of bar charts up, and we said, well, the cost of doing this common procedure is $80. And then when you get to Medicare, it's 98 and then it just goes up with the different insurance carriers. We did this about six times, and the delta was anywhere from 30 to 50%. So the insurance companies came back, and they said, well, it's obvious what you're doing. You're just passing along um, extra costs to us. <laughs> and that got a good chuckle from um, uh, a couple senators that were sitting in the room who were also patients. And so, so basically, the entire transaction is completed from start to finish. You've got this 20 to 30 to 40 cent gap. That's really the cost of having to do business with the insurance companies that are providing absolutely no value whatsoever to the patient. Patients get it. So really, when you want to know why are our costs so much less, it's because of this, it's because of disintermediation, or basically eliminating the middleman from our operations, from our processes. And, and, but there's another thing that's going on in the market, and I gotta warn uh, uh, physicians that are going into direct pay practices, that are going into uh, eliminating third party, and that's pricing. Because now you're pricing for the patient, you're not pricing you know, based upon what's mandated from, from you from the insurance companies and from the government. And uh, one of the issues has to do uh, with something that I call the pricing paradox. And um, it, it's real, uh, it's affected you know, my wife. It, when, when you start pricing, you, 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 you're very, very afraid. You know, if, I, if my price is too high, then my demand's gonna go down and I'm not gonna stay busy. 
that's a real worry, especially when you have people, um, you know, who already have insurance. You know, what are they going to do? How are they going to react to you? Um, what we found is that actually pricing is fairly inelastic, uh, which means that even if you raise the price, the demand doesn't really change that much for people who have high deductibles, for people who don't have any insurance. And then if you, if you have value that you've added to your, to your services, uh, that will also bring along people who have Cadillac plans and, 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 and those sorts of things. So, um, but what we found is in pricing that, that this was the most important part. Um, that the reason that uh, you have this pricing paradox where you're afraid to, to not charge the value that you need to charge for your services is because you're afraid that people won't come, you're afraid that they won't like you, they won't want your service, uh, and then you wind up setting your prices too low. So um, the solution to that is uh, something that Malcolm Gladwell, if anybody reads any business books, said, and it is the more that you know, the less risk that you're going to perceive. perceive. So. Uh, in pricing for direct pay models, you need to really understand who your competition is, try to figure out what they're pricing, and then um, basically you want uh, to post your prices everywhere you possibly can because if you can set that reference price, if you can say, this is the price of a knee surgery, this is the price of a home visit, this is the price for whatever your service is, and they can't find that price anywhere else, and you've actually sort of set the expectation of what that price is. Um, if, if By not providing prices, patients really are, don't have the information that they need to be able to make uh, the proper decision, and so they're gonna be all over the board. And that's sort of been our experience. So the more we, we post it, it's online. Social is very important, as you just heard. More and more people are looking to online and social to try to find prices and try to get information about physicians, you know, the Yelps of the world, the, there, there, there are half a dozen or more very big services out there and, 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 your, and your patients are looking and they're trying to find you and they're trying to figure out just exactly what that, that price point should be. So that's been our experience. Thank you. Oh, fantastic. Well, thank you all for showing up today and, and being engaged and involved in, in something that's moving patient care forward. Uh, again, my name's Dr. Josh, and I started Atlas MD, a direct care model. We're just coming up on our five-year anniversary, and we started fresh out of residency with zero patients and just one doctor, myself, and now we'll have six by the end of the year in two locations. But the movement continues to grow as we've helped over 100 doctors in the last 18 months convert to a model like this. And so it's exciting because of everything the other speakers have said. We know it's broken. We know we can help patients. We know there's a need. So now the, I think the biggest question for doctors is how do we get to that need? How, how do we go through the mechanics of fixing the problem? So we try to keep these talks pretty informal. I, I think the Q&A is the most helpful. So I'll speak briefly and then uh, feel free to interrupt or raise your hand at any time and, and ask questions and we'll revert back to the panel. But, um, to, to summarize our model at Atlas, it's a, a gym membership. It's based on age for a broad level of access. So it's $10 for kids, $50 for most adults for unlimited home visits, work visits, office visits, technology visits, no co-pays. Any procedure we can do is free of charge, and that includes stitches, biopsies, joint injections, EKGs, Holters, DEXs, ultrasounds, spirometry, cryotherapy, lesion removal. Um, and then some of the other things that we do that a lot of direct care practices do to add value. Uh, if there's any word I think you'll hear the most here besides direct care, it's value, value, value. Um, is we add value to our clinic by doing wholesale medications, labs, imaging, and pathology. So Kansas, we're lucky enough that we have, we're one of 44 states that allow physicians to dispense their own medications. So we can get them from the same suppliers that the pharmacy does, but at a fraction of the cost. So I can get 1,000 LASIKs for $8.33. Um, at our 10% markup, we're very transparent about that, it's still under a penny a pill. So now we outcompete Walmart um, and Amazon, and uh, well, Amazon doesn't do meds. But uh, I've asked them to, um, cause, uh, or Target, or who CVS just bought Target for $1.9 billion. And what we're seeing is 65% of the pharmaceutical retail business is being now held by four companies. And so we're not seeing innovation. We're not seeing them fight against each other for better prices so that our 
patients have better outcomes. And, uh, so that's where the doctor can step in and do these things. And as long as we're asking the right question, which is how do we make patient care better and more affordable, I think we'll get to the right answer every time. Um, I think for a lot of doctors, they struggle with this idea of how do I run a business? How do I be proud of my profit? How do I make profit or make a profitable clinic while at the same time really not losing heart with my patients? Um, we struggle with that because we're not taught that profit is good, that running a business means adding value back to our patients. Uh, every year we make it better, we're getting a better product for our patients. So we take a very bold stance to say that if we take our O seriously of do no harm, that's got to include do no financial harm. Um, I love it when a patient calls and says they're on Treximet. Uh, because we can just save them a ridiculous amount of money. Uh, Treximet, of course, is Imatrex, generic, and naproxen. I get a 500 naproxen for $15, and I get the Imatrex for $6. The last patient I had buying Imatrex was spending $300 a month on top of what her insurance paid. That is a value that is unprecedented in this market. Any other market, there, it's very efficient. Walmart, Amazon, Target, come Black Friday, they'll all very efficiently compete against each other for value and price, but not when it comes to medicine, not when it comes to healthcare. And I think in large part because the physicians have let their role as the, as the leader go. We just, well, insurance pays for that, so I don't have to answer that problem. Well, now insurance isn't paying for it well, or the obstacles are worse than the solution. So. Uh, CBC for us is under $2. An A1C is $2.20. A PSA is $2.70. Why are we insuring these things? We shouldn't be. Um, insurance is for the big stuff. Car wrecks, cancers, heart attacks. It's not for these daily things. Stitches cost me a dollar a packet, but they're going to expire if I don't use them, so I make them free. I don't have to. It's part of the value we've chosen. Other doctors have chosen different mixes. But the point is, it's cheaper than the $1,500 ER visit. So now we can build a model that's showing our patients how we're helping them. We're, we're adding value, we're solving problems for them that no one else is. Pathology for us used to cost $300 a sample, now we go to Boise, Ohio for $40. Now I can offer more care more often at less of an impact to my patients' lives. So uh, if we keep looking at that, the direct care model is bound to succeed. And I think that's why this slow tsunami of, of clinics starting all over the country are really breaking down the old way. You know, the, the phrase of disruptive innovation, you can take that even farther to creative destruction. We're creatively breaking down the old barriers and building up new solutions. And, and I, that's what's so exciting about being included in the direct care movement. Um, radiology for us, you know, $20 to $40 for most x-rays, $100 for ultrasounds, $200 for CTs, and $400 for MRIs. So for our patients, it's cheaper than their insurance deductible if they go through us. And we can get it same day. So I had a poor guy, had a kidney stone twice, or one stone, but we needed to CAT scan him twice within seven days. The hardest part of the whole process was not talking to me, not getting the test, not getting the CT or the repeat CT. It's dealing with the urologist, going through insurance, waiting for the hassle, being in pain, but not being able to get anything because yeah, waiting for the pharmacy to approve your insurance for your narcotic because you have a nine millimeter kidney stone. Um, but I can't dispense it through my office like I could everything else, the nausea medicine, the Toradol, that's a dollar. So uh, he saw very clearly what it was like to experience the current system and the direct care system. And we needed a second CAT scan to see if the lithotripsy worked. He called and said, all right, I'm ready for it. 30 minutes later, I had results. Because when you pay cash, things happen quickly. And so it's just interesting how effective this model can be. So I think doctors are constantly asking themselves, well, maybe this is too good to be true. We often joke, if you really do get it, you should wave the bullshit flag, because it should sound too good to be true. Um, and so they'll say, well, they, uh, yeah, but insurance will hate it. No, insurance loves it. I, and I think the problem is that as physicians, we keep attacking the system in, in a, a tone of antagonism, not synergy. So we've tried from the very beginning to show insurance companies how we'll actually help them. They're not, they, they need our help because they're not doing it well now. We're the gatekeepers of care. We're the providers. We're on the ground. You know, it's up to us to take that power to innovate a solution and then spread that through the system. So we can decrease an employer's insurance premiums by 30 to 60 percent. We have employees who get $1,000 raises each year because their insurance costs less. That's a huge bonus for them. And the insurance company is happy with that because we're managing risk better. We're, showing, we're, we're pulling things away from them, so Walmart's not making $300 off Treximet, I'm making 10% off 
off six dollars. So uh, it's a value that the, you're putting the patient first. Everything else after that uh, is understandably secondary. So it gives us a lot of autonomy while changing the system, and providing better care. So uh, that's a, a the quick spiel about us, and, and we'll open it up for questions to the panel. But again, thank you for your attendance. Thank you, Dr. Josh and Jack. It's actually uh, one of the reasons I wanted to have this panel was that one of the things that uh, I hear is that it's uh, too good to be true a, a lot. And uh, explaining uh, how you can charge the low prices and how much you're getting the, the pharmaceuticals for, I think is, is something that is uh, important for everybody to hear. Um, a question I have in, in line with that is, I know Dr. Smith has adjusted his prices um, at my last check, he had adjusted them five times, and each time he had adjusted them downwards. Uh, I know I talked to Jack, and I think he has a different story on this a little bit, but it's a good reason, and it's an interesting reason to me because it, it's the uh, the market is working, and it also means that he doesn't have much competition yet. But at, at least, can you talk about that? And I don't know if you've changed your prices at all, Josh. Not yet. Sure, sure. Well, um, what we discovered is when we first went into into business that uh, we wanted to get market penetration, and 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 by doing market penetration, you, you go in with a good cost, a uh, a good value to the patient. And uh, we were very, very successful, full up, slam busy from the day we opened the doors. Um, the problem that we have with this, and, and, and profitable, the problem we have with this is right now, uh, we continue to raise prices because of the supply and demand issue, um, but it's not working. Um, we're actually, um, the more we raise prices, it seems like the more the demand increases. And right now, uh, we're actually uh, scheduling patients for January and February and August which is not a real good problem to have uh, because access is so important. Uh, so, um, you know, and, but looking at pricing, one of the things that we noticed is, um, is, is as long as you raise your prices about 10% or less, people don't notice it. That's just a general industry thing. People expect prices to go up. They understand what inflation is. And so at each time that we will raise our prices, we will go back and look at it and I'll say, who's complained? Who's had a problem with this? It, no issues. No, there are simply no problems because I think they're used to such sky high prices and such poor service in the general community uh, that they're more than happy to accept these increases. And, and I also think my wife's a pretty good physician and that has something to do with it too. So, All right. I think I have one more question. Oh, we already got somebody at the mic. I was going to ask a question while some people were moving, but yes. Uh, I'm an anesthesiologist in North Carolina and a first time attending. And, uh, I was wondering if you could comment. I understand the value for a specific service line, a specific procedure. I really get it for primary care because there's a whole host of things that you can do under the auspices of a monthly membership fee. Mm -hmm. um, but what I'm not understanding is unless an employer or an individual stops carrying insurance altogether, they're saving money on each individual interaction and I get all that. What I don't get is if they still have to have, if an employer still has to have insurance coverage for a list of services that are not offered, where's the actual savings? You're saving on each individual thing that you do, mm -hmm. but if they still have to carry insurance for a host of things that you do not offer, then they still have an insurance premium, your employer's still paying insurance, and so in, unless you go abandon insurance altogether and have complete cooperation from a number of multidisciplinary providers, Where's the actual savings when you switch to the free market? Uh, and a side question, if you can remember, I'm in an area where there's complete monopoly. It's basically underserved with a critical access system. So there is no competition. There's one orthopedic group. There's a couple general surgery groups. I'm getting the anesthesia business no matter what. Payments are lousy, but volume keeps us active. Um, is there a mechanism for employing this? I see the value of the patient, but how do you, would you go about convincing administrations and providers that are already in a monopoly system to be uh, transparent in their pricing? Uh, yeah, I, I like this question because we get it a lot, uh, and I'll kind of rephrase it to say, um, people ask us, how do I afford insurance and this? And to which I say, how do you afford insurance without us? The, the direct care model in synergy with the right type of insurance. And I don't know if Adam Russo is here yet. Um, I think he talks tomorrow. Fantastic speaker. And there's other groups here like um, the uh, co-ops that show how you adjust those insurance pricing. 
So we're insuring too much. Uh, actually, ho uh, hopefully a lot of you have seen this. Malcolm Gladwell was talking about this recently on a Medscape interview. We probably need less insurance. Uh, car wrecks, cancers, heart attacks, big stuff, yes. Anesthesiology, sometimes, obviously not all the time. Um, but medicines, labs, family medicine, outpatient medicine. And I think you have the, a, a nice representation of the, the spectrum here from a fee to service to chronic care um, and, and how you would do those different models uh, in their unique ways. But when you carve out um, everything that we can from insurance, you make it 30 to 60% cheaper, but also you're not making claims anymore. So you, it's like life insurance. I can only die once or twice, right? They only give me a check for it once though. Um, but it doesn't benefit me at all. It benefits my wife and a cabana boy. Uh, and hopefully a good cabana boy, but I get no value out of it. But it's cheap, it's easy, there's limited paperwork, there's low risk for fraud. Uh, and home insurance and car insurance are analogous to the next degree, but health insurance, we're trying to use this huge $3 trillion system to pay for Lasix, that's a penny a pill or less. I can't imagine what it is on Walmart's volume if, if our volume is, is you know, under $10. So now you pull that out, you pull the administrative burden out. So the hardest conversation we had about this was with insurance themselves. Bill Ashley runs um, Allied National Insurance. They're based out of Kansas City. And he said, you know, if I give you best case scenario, we cut out 100% of the cost of family medicine, that's not enough for us to change. Um, you know, it only represents 10 to 20% of our payout. So, okay, yep, yeah, but you're looking at direct care under this umbrella that just is family medicine payouts. It's co-pays to the patient, it's procedures, it's the family medicine piece, but it's the pharmacy with the wholesale meds. It's the lab, the imaging center, the pathology. No one goes to the ER when they have their doctor's cell phone. So they can call, text, email their doctor and find out and avoid these high risk expenses um, you know, uh, last Thanksgiving, I, long story short, did stitches for someone at 1030 at night for free because that's part of our model. And so they brought me pumpkin pie. I do three free stitches. Everyone's happy. Uh, and they save $1,500. That's 1500 saved to their employer. That's a, a, a savings to their risk level for their insurance. So we've had groups actually pay less each year in their health insurance because they're not using it. Because the insurance stat is 95% of groups who have a $5,000 deductible won't reach it in a given year. So it's probably no wonder that the Affordable Care Act is a $6,000 deductible. So, and that's in a bloated system with these high costs. You compare that to a system like we're running in direct care um, where meds and labs are 95% off. And we've gotten chemotherapy for breast cancer 99% off from the pharmacy. Um, recently we had a patient accidentally that was a mistake at the lab side, but they build our labs through the normal cash rate. So it's a great little insight. Uh, it was $1,028 for blood work that when we ran it back through our price, $39, 97% savings. That's what we're adding to the system. So that's why it saves on that insurance cost. And, and, and from our perspective, we, we, we don't uh, do insurance at all. But what we find is that the, you know, it's, it's one thing to have insurance and another thing to get care. And uh, most of the patients that, that, that see us, we, we, we lose a few, but we've gained a lot of other ones. My, my wife's practice became more and more and more and more Medicaid as her patients got older and as she was not able to see other patients. Uh, when she went into this practice model, what happened were, were a couple of things. There was a huge underserved market out there. There are people who don't have any insurance at all, people who have high deductibles, and that's changing every day as insurance goes through the roof. People come in and they see, oh, I can get in there, I can see an MD, uh, and I can um, get taken care of in 30, 40 minutes, spend a couple hundred dollars, they're happy to do that. You know, that's, uh, their co-pays are, are, are getting as expensive as, as it costs to do the care properly. And so what we really found is that it's not an elastic price. Um, you know, that as we're raising the price, the people still are demanding the service and they're, and they're willing to pay for it. We have Medicare patients that will go somewhere else, but we fill back with them with, with all sorts of patients who've never had access before. Uh, we have some people who have Cadillac plans, they go somewhere else, but they leave a hole open for another patient uh, who has no access, who has no insurance, or has sky-high deductibles. So we've not seen any uh, issues at all with, with, with patients coming in and seeing us. It's just, just kind of like if you have children and um, there's a public bus, but it takes an hour and a half to get there, you pay for that bus, but you drive them anyway. 
Um, you know, you might send your kid to public school. You're still paying taxes for the for the you know for the public for you going to private for public school. And I think patients are looking at it this way as well. They want their problem to be taken care of, and they're willing to pay for it, even if they have insurance. And for the second part of your question, there's uh, some speakers that will be here. Um, for the rest of the time, there's some people that I can see in this room right now that have fought with the uh, their local markets, and we'll be talking about that as well. So I think we'll get to that in a little bit. Dr. Katab, I saw you come up, but I saw Dr. Smith come up. Can I? Uh, We're not playing favorites, but it not, is. I mean, not uh, playing <laughs> favorites, but. Dr. Just, Smith. Just a quick point, Josh, I think that needs mm -hmm. to be made in the value that direct primary care in this model brings is how truly disruptive it is because you're working for your patient mm -hmm. and you're not getting backhanded or you're not getting overrides or bribes or a salary from a hospital. So if a patient needs their gallbladder I'm taken out. I'm definitely not getting any bribes. No, yes. Yeah. So if a patient needs their gallbladder out, you're going to make sure that patient goes to the person who's yep. best for the job, not up the sausage tube, you know, to where they make sausage at the troll hospital. So I thought you meant the legislative a, house. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that is a hugely disruptive uh, part of these kind of practices, I think, that needed to be mentioned. And what I love is, because you kind of touched on this point, it only took one surgery center of Oklahoma to really start to disrupt everything. One you know, metric of competition changes a whole other system. So it, uh, we're out competing the Walmarts the, on meds or on labs or on other things. It only takes one surgery center to show that this is possible and working in other areas. Um, and the trust I th is what I think Dr. Smith was speaking to as well. Um, our patients don't trust us as much as they used to uh, because it's a scary system. It's, it's bureaucratic, it's slow. And Steve Covey has a great book on the speed of trust and the transparency that direct care or, or fee-for-service brings to the patient, they can exactly decide, I, there's the price, and does that match the value for me? So they get to make a clear decision. And, and patients are starting to get educated about this. As patients are starting to see prices being posted online, as they're starting to see concierge practices, you know, uh, no third-party practices, they're getting used to the idea that there's another alternative to finding health care other than the traditional insurance and uh, route that they're, they've been used to taking. Sorry for making you wait. Dr. Katab. I, uh, I wanted to address Dr. Davis's concern, and Josh mentioned most of what I wanted to, to, to say. Oh, so fantastic. Very <laughs> uh, What are we saving? We're saving the whole system a lot of money. Now, some of us, in, depending on which industry we're in, will feel the pain now and then be grateful for it later, and some of us will not. But the employers, self-insured employers, are paying higher premiums now. And as Josh's, at the primary care level, or price MD, or the whole system of free market establishes itself in every community, there will be increased deflation. That deflation will translate into lower premiums. Okay? Unfortunately, that will mean the broker will have to have earning less commission. The Stop loss insurance is going to have to come down because there's less triggering of what uh, uh, Adam was going to do. Tremendous contribution to this stuff in the forest. Maybe the millions. So, all this will happen. It will take some time, but it will happen. And the self insured employers will be very great. Yeah. Uh, in our community, just for one example, we have in Southern California, the dominant market is Kaiser. A lot of patients that I see step out of Kaiser, come, pay out of pocket, okay, I went, uh, for surgical treatment. Mm -hmm. I asked the cardiologist as well, a lot of Kaiser patients are stepping out of Kaiser, seeking second opinions, paying out of pocket because not trusting what Josh mentioned, you know, they're not trusting because the system is so complicated. And out of network fees are going sky high is another reason. Mm -hmm. Great questions. And there, there's one thing when Dr. Smith talked about, as uh, we have somebody else moving to a mic, as Dr. Smith talked about the savings in uh, Oklahoma County earlier, that, did, that also doesn't count the uh, savings on referrals and some of the other uh, savings that can happen uh, throughout the market. Thanks. And forgive me for my question. I'm, I'm going to ask you all just to dumb this down a little bit. It's the first time I've been here and I'm hearing these ideas and read about it and thought about these things a lot. But 
obviously y'all have a lot of experience with this and a lot of that went by at just kind of light speed. So you mentioned being paid for your time, Mr. Brown, your wife's being paid for her time and your That's billing correct. model. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. Um, I'll show you a picture of, of, of what it looks like at the same time. Because my background is I'm a, a private practice ear, nose, and throat doctor, and you know obviously the surgery center model makes sense. There's no Oklahoma Surgery Center in, sure. in where I am. Well, this is this is a little different, and, and here's here's one of the things I love uh, about dealing with people like Josh and myself and all. One size doesn't fit all, you know, and um, and, and and in the free market. Uh, I'm going to do a lot of R&D, so I go over and I rob and duplicate, you know, everything I see from Josh over here, and I bring it into to our practice, and um, you know, and and hybrids and changes, and, and and the market is great. What what we decided was there are two things that the physician has to sell, and that is time and expertise, and um, and the legal market works this way. And so um, we're basically uh, we're, we're turning, the, turning the model on his head and we're saying, okay, um, if you come in and see me, the way that, the way that she makes, makes her living is by spending time treating patients. She does, you know, so she bills, if you come in for 20 minutes or 30 minutes, you can look it up and clearly see, this is how much I'm gonna be paying to see the physician for that amount of time. It's really easy to understand. It's really easy to, um, to demonstrate. And, and patients get it right away. It, it doesn't take very long at all for them to get it. So um, you come in, you say, I want a 30 minute visit. It's gonna cost $150 or whatever it is. Physician sees you, spends that time with you. That's what you pay for, and then you're done. And they purchase it front end, so you don't say, I mean, uh, you know, you, the idea of putting a timer in the exam room seems distasteful. Do they say, I want 30 minutes, and they buy 30 minutes, and then you're like, well, we've got 30 minutes, or? How do you, is it, is it a flex thing or is it Well, it's, 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 it's done a couple of ways. We, we, we pretty much have a good idea how long it takes to see people. And, and, and obviously we'll tell you up front, it's gonna be about 15 minutes. It may be 10, it right. may be 20. Um, but it does a couple of things. As a consumer, you're, you're, you're now on your, on your nickel. <laughs> so con consumers treat their time differently when they're paying for it. Which is which is makes it more efficient for you, makes it more efficient for them, and they value it more. Fewer stories. Ex exactly. She, we also have one day a week where she has an open schedule, uh, which has turned into a wonderful thing because we get new patients uh, and, and keep new blood coming into the uh, into the clinic uh, by doing that. One one day a week, uh, excuse me, one day a month, she has what she calls a five dollar day, and this is just her attempt that she she knows patients out there that struggle even for $5. She, she won't give it away for free, but she'll see people for $5 on that day, and that's her way of giving back to the community. So you can structure it however yeah. you want to. Kind of the fun part about that is the, the ability to be creative exactly. and say, well, I'm ear, nose, and throat, so the derm model may not be perfect in the surgery center model or the, the primary care, but there is a, a, a solution. Even within specialties of uh, ENT, there's uh, Dr. George in Atlanta. She has a radio show. She's ENT, and she's moving to do a direct care model You know, in a mix. Uh, you've got on one side your fee-for-service pathology, radiology, dermatology type stuff, in the middle, there's a whole lot of other specialties, and then anything that's more chronic care is great for a membership. You got you got your pathology costs from us. Today. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Um, cold diagnostics in Boise, it, amazing job. Forty bucks saved us hundreds of dollars. It, it, it's amazing when you're paying cash. Suddenly, you get different prices. Yeah, it's uh, astounding how that works. Well, you're worth something now. Yeah. You know, now that coal wants to compete for our business, and and we robbed and and uh, uh, duplicated from you on that piece and. So um, it, we haven't done that in a while, that, that innovative side. Um, uh, you, we, we've held ourselves back to this idea of what will insurance let me do? What will, yeah. And, and real quick for Atlas and D, you don't bill insurance. I mean, I understand patients have a hybrid, but you still just, you just take cash right. payments for your yep. membership. I haven't coded anything in five years. Now, just, just to that point, uh, we, we uh, provide as a value added we will give an estimate of, of, of what the CPT codes is if you wanted to go ahead and submit that to insurance. But we don't do that as, a, as, a, as routine. And when we went to the, uh, to, to the um, uh, Salem, uh, to the legislature, to try to pass legislation to require them to pay, what actually ended up happening was we had a side deal where they said, well, we don't want to actually create legislation that does this, but we'll go ahead and do it anyway. And uh, as, the end result is our patients are getting paid now.
We have uh, a few minutes until our uh, first break here. So let's call this the last question. Hi, it's uh, Eric Wright. Um, I'm with HealthSmart, a third party administrator. I'm not a troll. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard a lot about product and price mm -hmm. I wanted to see if I could frame up a conversation around distribution. And what I mean by that is how do like-minded providers attract patients into their office? And what I'd like to do is frame it from the perspective of how employers purchase healthcare. Today, about two-thirds of all privately employed uh, Americans purchase healthcare through their self-funded plan. Uh, so they actually don't have insurance like you traditionally think of insurance. In fact, insurance companies and PPOs are the worst enemy uh, because they're the ones that, that have had these secretive practices of billing and discounting and all that stuff. But most self-funded employers are directed by their broker or consultant on which types of products to buy. And I'm really happy to see we have uh, Brad Williams, Paul McNeese, and Jeff. Todd Means here that are consultants in this space, and, and they have self-funded employers. Those are going to drive about 95% of the employer's decisions of where they should put their health care. And I think engaging with those types of people are where perhaps your biggest gains in distribution can be. And I can actually speak to that. I think a, a large part of our success has been working uh, for employers, getting them to join through selling good insurance value and, and convenience. So we actually work with a team of independent agents and brokers um, but for that reason. Go to the employer, show them how we can help solve the problem. Uh, and there's countless uh, benefits to self-funded if you're not familiar. I think the best of which is self-funded plans are exempt from the Affordable Care Act. So you answer the biggest question of how do I comply with all these rules? Kind of don't have to now if you pull that out. But the prices are still going up, so how do you lower prices? insure less and your average broker agent until they once they understand dpc they may be you know concerned but once they see the connection now they can add value back and uh, a lot of our agents that we work with find even more financial success because what they say is now the spin business the companies aren't spending on hsas and 401ks and aflac type plans anymore because the insurance just went up 40%. So the more we can help the employees, the more that money funnels back to other valuable uh, financial products uh, that help the employer and the, the agents. So yeah, we, it's a win-win. We, we have a relationship with a hospital, and the hospital has, is recommending that, um, that their um, uh, uh, employees come and, come and see our practice for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, quality of care is pretty good at our clinic, and the second, is our prices are very reasonable. Pay, uh, they'll come in, they'll pay us, they'll bring back the bill, and they'll get reimbursed, uh, and then actually save the hospital a significant amount of money. Uh, so that's an informal uh, way of, of, of getting around some of this. So if you want to do direct care, find those people and take them out to lunch. Absolutely. We have time for, uh, I, it looks like, one more question. <laughs> the, where's the ear, nose, and throat surgeon who asked the question earlier? He's a, what, what we've done at the surgery center that's worked out well is to, is to have basically simple and complex. And everybody has been okay with that. And then when the surgeon sees the patient, we have a pretty good idea of whether it's simple or complex. And you'll see those prices on our website. And that's relatively new because we found ourselves underwater on some of these cases that just turned out to be a disaster. We knew it ahead of time, but it felt like a bait and switch to give them a different price. So we've just split that up, simple and complex. And to follow that, um, one of the big developments here in Oklahoma City is that Deaconess Hospital, the only full service hospital I know of that has kind of jumped on board, they, they are actually providing maternity pricing. So, having a hard time wrapping their heads around how do you do that, I sat down with them and I said, I'm in, I envision a, a toll road with multiple exits, each one of which is priced. So look at you know, vaginal good. delivery, uncomplicated, no epidural. Vaginal delivery with epidural, child stays one more night than mom. I mean, maybe there are 12 exits and you price each one of them but there are so many innovative things that are happening to address your, your question, you know, how do I, you know, do you, do you charge by the time interval? Do you charge by complexity? You can put these things in different boxes, and everybody's happy as long as they know up front 
what it is. And on the maternity pricing, the the big the big hurdle to overcome was there is that toll exit you cannot even see or price. And just don't worry about that, but price the ones you do know. You cover 90% of it. You save millions and millions and millions of dollars to the system a year and more than likely enough to cover the one you can't even see. Well, and the brilliant thing about that is my partner, last time he had a baby, the, again, same 23-hour, non-complicated delivery, hospital bill, $17,400 and change. Cash price after one phone call, $1,900 and change. The 91% difference. So we've got this completely bloated system. And you know, if you read a lot of business books, you'll, they'll talk about the, some of the most successful companies right now are, are simplifying things. Netflix, Airbnb, Uber. And so that simple and complex to us sounds really hard because we see the thousand things it could be, but if we could break it down to something even a lawyer could understand, then, <laughs> where's Phil? Okay, um, uh, you, then, then it's very simple, and the consumer grabs that, and they understand we can't know everything, but you gotta give them an idea, a roadmap for uh, what it could cost and what, what it could be, then they can start making some decision processes. Right, we'll, we'll break down, for instance, you know, a simple procedure, you know, a, a, a non-surgical procedure price will be one way, you know, a skin exam or something like that. If you have something surgical, that's gonna be a second level, second tier, and we'll charge more for that time because we've got more expenses. You know, we've got overhead, we've got materials, we've got an assistant, those sorts of things. Oh, by the way, we have um, one and a half FTEs for a physician, and I think- We're at uh, half a full-time. We're at half an FTE. We run a four-doctor yeah. practice with two staff. Yeah. yeah two uh, nurses. So uh, one of the reasons prices are so low is we, we don't have all the administrative costs, uh, and you do need to pass that into your prices. That's Josh. I, I don't I'm believe in that. I, yeah. uh, we're at least we use whole people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got nothing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank thank the panel for us.